My dear friends, almost 20 years ago, at a fundraising dinner for a school that serves learning disabled children, the father of one of the school's students delivered a speech that would never be forgotten by all who attended. After extolling the school and its dedicated staff, he offered a question. Everything God has supposedly done, everything God has supposedly done has been done with perfection, the father said. Yet my son, Shay, cannot learn things as other children do. He cannot understand things as other children do. Where is God's plan reflected in my son? The audience was stilled by the query. The father continued, I believe, the father answered, that when God brings a child like Shay into the world, an opportunity to realize the divine plan presents itself. And it comes in the way people treat that child. And then he told this story. Shay and his dad had walked past a park where some boys Shay knew were playing baseball. Shay asked, do you think they'll let me play? Shay's father knew that most boys would not want him on their team, but the father understood that if his son were allowed to play, it would give him a much-needed sense of belonging. So Shay's father approached one of the boys on the field and asked if Shay could play. The boy looked around for guidance from his teammates, getting none. He took matters into his own hands and said, look, we're losing by six runs. The game is in the eighth inning. I guess he can be in our team, and we'll try to put him up to bat maybe in the ninth inning. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Shea's team scored a few runs. They were still behind by three. Top of the ninth, Shea puts on a glove, plays in the outfield. No hits came his way, but he was so ecstatic just to be on the field, he was grinning from ear to ear as his father waved from the stands. In the bottom of the ninth inning, Shea's team scored again, now with two outs, bases loaded. The potential winning run was on base. But Shea was scheduled to be the next batter. Would the team actually let Shea bat at this juncture and give away their chance to win the game. Surprisingly, Shea was given the bat. First pitch comes, and Shea swung clumsily and missed. The pitcher took a few steps forward to toss the ball softly toward Shea. As the pitch came, Shea made contact, hit a slow ground ball to the pitcher. Pitcher picked up the soft grounder could easily have thrown the ball to the first baseman. Shea would have been out. That would have ended the game. Instead, the pitcher took the ball, threw it on a high arc to right field, far beyond the reach of the first baseman, and everyone started yelling, Shea, run to first. Run to first. Never in his life had Shea made it to first base. He scampered down the baseline, wide-eyed and startled. Everyone yelled, run to second, run to second. By the time Shea was rounding first base, the right fielder had the ball. He could have thrown the ball to the second baseman for a tag, but the right fielder understood what the pitcher's intentions had been. So he threw the ball high and far over the third baseman's head. Shea ran towards second base as the runners ahead of him deliriously circled the bases toward home. As Shea reached second base, the opposing shortstop ran to him, turned him in the direction of third base, and shouted, run to third. As Shea rounded third, the boys from both teams were screaming, Shay, run home! Shay ran home, stepped on home plate, and was cheered as the hero for hitting a grand slam and winning the game for his team. That day, said the father softly with tears now rolling down his face, 
That day, the boys from both teams helped bring a piece of the divine plan into this world. This Sabbath, the only one between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is known as the Sabbath of Return, or Shabbat Shuvah, from the opening word in Hosea 14, verse 2. Shuvah Yisrael ad Adonai Elohecha ki chashalta ba'avonecha. Return. Shuvah. Jewish people, O Israel, to the eternal your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity, but you can always turn yourself around. I forgive you. Salachti kidvarecha, says God. I forgive you whenever you do the right thing and make the right turn. The antidote to the crude, vulgar, slanderous social media attacks filling cyberspace is the decency and divine plan reflected in this beautiful story I just shared. It is our human acts of compassion, mercy, empathy that turn us back to God and make it possible for us to endure, to suffer the sometimes excruciatingly painful limits of the natural world and the finitude of our physical bodies. Imitating and finding God have nothing to do with the limits or boundaries of life. Imitating and finding God have everything to do with filling in what's between the limits, however short or long our days. God is the source who did create a world with severe limitations, a natural world which is amoral and sometimes unjust. Because God's physical creation is inherently finite, we make a mistake in looking for a moral God in the limitations and boundaries of life. Yes, God is the source of those limits and that finitude, but God is also the strength to cope with whatever befalls us within the confines of life. That's hard when you've lost a loved one. But people do find the strength somehow. One of the greatest proofs of God's whereabouts, I believe, as in that baseball story, is in the compassion and outpouring of love and support people extend to each other in their times of greatest distress. I believe God weeps with us, not against us. And if that's the case, then God is in the human touch, in the faces, the hugs, the silence, and the love of those who stand with us and by us, no matter what. God-like love works through people in this world. As a member wrote me just after Rosh Hashanah services 48 hours ago, COVID may have changed our lives in so many ways. This 20th year since 9-11 is being remembered by its devastation to our lives and the changes it brought upon us. Yet we still have hopes and we still have a Jewish faith rooted in the belief that we can face the future in a life reimagined, brimming with new possibilities no matter what has happened. When you're a part of a people like ours and part of a religious community like Temple Israel, it is a continuous positive reminder that you are not alone. Ken Yehi Ratzon, so may it be for all of us.